Thank you, Dr. Farmer, and um, thank you to the department for this opportunity. I think that um, it feels really special to be up here today and that this is a really great t tradition that we have here. Um, it's a nice prompt to reflect back on my time at UC Davis. I still vividly remember my first day as an intern, and so to think about how far we've all come and to think that in just three months, my class is gonna be graduating and spreading our little surgeon wings is um, really pretty amazing. I have no financial disclosures. I'm clearly far from an elite athlete and I've never had a performance coach. Um, what I present today is merely my research and my musings on a topic that I think is interesting and that could have a pretty significant impact on our field. So to start, this is a photo that I took along the American River Trail where I first stumbled upon the topic of coaching. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, the River Trail stretches 32 miles from the Jaboom Bridge in downtown Sacramento to Folsom Lake. This picture here is um, near Sacramento State University, which is only a couple miles from my house. So during my research years, I reluctantly, at least at first, took up running as a hobby, largely in part because doctors Jamie Anderson and Jenny Olson had decided to run the California International Marathon that December. I couldn't believe they were willingly spending their free time training to run 26.2 miles, but I liked spending time with them and I wanted to get in better shape. So I started running a couple times a week with them and as the distance increased, I kept running with them, and then I was hooked. Why take this new opportunity to sleep in when I could get up and go for a long run? <laughs> One of my favorite parts of running was being with my friends, but of course, not every run could be coordinated. During a standard um, marathon training plan, you average about 400 miles. So I spent plenty of solo miles out on the trail enjoying this river view. After exhausting my playlists and several audiobooks, I started exploring podcasts, and I found this podcast called Trained. In the podcast, the host, Ryan, interviews a variety of people, athletes, CEOs, entrepreneurs, psychologists, all in an effort to describe and understand what he called the comprehensive approach to training. He's looking for the small changes that can give an already elite athlete the extra edge. He breaks down this approach into what he calls the five facets of training movement, recovery, nutrition, mindfulness, and sleep. And even though they're divided into the silos for the podcast, he talks about how interconnected they all are. As I was listening and trying to apply little bits of his insight to my marathon training plan, I started to think about some of the similarities and differences between coaching athletes and training surgical residents. The first facet, movement, easily applicable to surgery. Just as Steph Curry practices his three-point shot, so it's perfect during game time, we practice our technical skills outside of the operating room, not tying or the peg transfer, for example. Pro athletes talk a lot about recovery, stretching, massage, ice baths, foam rolling. In surgery, despite the often physical demands and poor ergonomics of operating, we don't talk much about recovery. The best piece of advice I got as a med student going into surgery in related to recovery was to invest in compression socks, which I do enjoy. There's an entire industry devoted to sports nutrition. It's typically, when we talk about it as surgeon though, it's typically in reference to our patient's albumin and how they're gonna be a high risk surgical candidate. Despite knowing how important good nutrition is, we've all spent too many call shifts running on McDavis sandwiches and crackers stolen from the nurse's station. I know when I'm able to take the time to eat well, I feel better and I imagine that I perform better too. I know I don't perform well when hangry. Mindfulness, it's gaining traction with athletes as well as doctors. When I was running, I got in the habit of setting an intention for the run while I tied my shoes. Tying the shoes was a necessary part of the run, so I always had the opportunity. And soon it became second nature. It made me feel present and engaged in the process. I thought about my routine for surgery. Unfortunately, no shoe tying with clogs, but what about hand washing? Dr. Chopper out of Michigan writes about finding what he calls islands of mindfulness within oceans of chaos. He suggests that hand washing could be an ideal moment for all of us to slow down, reflect, and remember what a privilege it is to care for others. Why not incorporate this moment of mindfulness as we scrub before our cases? I think we can all agree that we don't get enough sleep. Our sleep training boils down to an ACGME required slideshow at the start of each year. 
now elite athletes have coaches to help them tackle the complexities of each of these facets to maximize their performance how much better could we be if we took a more holistic approach to our training would coaches be able to address these topics for all of us and coaches aren't just for athletes anymore performance coaches are now widely used in corporate america coaching improves leadership and interpersonal skills and it encourages personal growth many of the strategies strategies they use focus on mindfulness and emotional intelligence. They aim to help individuals understand their subconscious driving forces so they can one, make better decisions in the heat of the moment, and two, rec recover more quickly from a setback. I can think of at least a few parallels where that could be useful in surgery. What exactly makes a coach? The definition is a bit nebulous. People may describe their coach as a boss, a teacher, a guide, an editor, a mentor, or a supporter, just to name a few. In the vaguest of terms, a, for, a performance coach helps an individual improve their ability to perform a certain task. They provide constructive feedback, they help strategize ways to overcome obstacles, and they inspire advancement of skills. In surgery, we talk a lot about the importance of mentorship. In this classic model, we aspire to be like our mentors. We go to them because of their current position, their skills, and their insight. They tend to guide us by their personal experience. They may share how they got where they are. They shepherd us, inspired us, and are thought to pull us up towards our goals. A coach is a bit different. Coaches are typically more objective, and they less commonly share their personal experience or achievements. They are said to push us towards our goals. However, because we haven't traditionally had performance coaches in surgery, I think there's a lot of overlap here between mentors and coaches, especially for the resident experience. So why don't, have, why don't surgeons have coaches? Well, in surgery, we're taught that after a predetermined point in our training, we no longer need instruction. While see one, do one, teach one is not used quite so literally anymore, after being signed off on various procedures, we're rarely observed or critiqued. A key component in our training instead relies upon, upon discipline. The early mornings, the late nights, meeting deadlines in between 80 hour work weeks and checking on a patient in the middle of the night because it's the right thing to do. Most of us have probably been described as type A by a friend or family member along the way. We've been trained to hold ourselves accountable. But where does that leave us on the curve of mastery? After five arterial lines, am I perfect? 10 central lines? How many laparoscopic cholecystectomies? How many thoracotomies? As someone who's, signed, who's met my ACGME requirements in those categories, I can assure you I feel light years away from a master surgeon. And as I get close to shedding the security blanket of residency, I'm curious how we keep inching closer towards mastery and prevent a performance plateau. Or even worse, how do we prevent a peak and subsequent decline in our performance? Performing a great operation requires excellence in multiple domains. For a lap coli, for example, you must first gain access to the peritoneum. If you get a high pressure reading, should you try the varus again? Or should you swap to the Hassan entry? Or should you have tried at Palmer's point to start? You need to demonstrate the critical view of safety before clipping and dividing the cystic duct and the cystic artery. Did you communicate with the circulating nurse and the scrub tech so you had the appropriate equipment when you were ready? Did you tell them as you were closing so they could make the necessary preparations? And what about the 5513 consult pager that keeps going off in the background? Oh, and the 6100 pager too. Were you able to maintain your focus on the operation? Performance coaching for surgeons can and should address each of these domains. Now, even though it wasn't traditionally called coaching, we know coaching is already a major part of our surgical education. By the time we've graduated, we'll have completed a minimum of 850 cases, and we're constantly being coached by faculty in the operating room on our operative technique. Now, that doesn't mean that every attending's coaching style is a perfect fit for your learning style, but it is the primary way we learn and improve our skills over time. The topic of performance coaching for surgeons in particular has emerged in the literature over the past five years or so as a way to enhance surgical training and continuing education. I'm going to highlight a few studies that show how coaching can be used for each domain of surgical performance. Most of the literature on coaching residents' technical skills involves the sim lab or the wet lab. 
In this study, residents were, re were randomized either to the control group, group C here, or the surgical video coaching group, group SVC. Residents in both groups were filmed performing an intestinal anastomoses on cadaveric dogs. Residents in the coaching group had a 30-minute coaching session with an expert, during which time they reviewed the video recording. Then both groups performed the anastomosis again three weeks later. The graph here shows the baseline and final performance scores for each group. The coaching group uh, had significantly improved outcomes, while the other group had no change in their skills. Among those who participated in the coaching group, all agreed that the session improved their technical skills and that video coaching format was an efficient teaching method. Surgical video coaching is akin to reviewing game tape for athletes. It gives residents an opportunity to see themselves in action and identify their strengths and weaknesses. Video coaching may allow time for residents to reflect on their performance and be more present during the discussion. It can also provide structure and standardization to the feedback. In this study, they used the GROW model, goal, reality, options, and wrap up for the video coaching sessions. Goal, the session starts by orienting to a specific endpoint or a desired improvement. In this case, performing the anastomosis. The next step, reality. The coach or resident illustrates the situation. Here, I'm performing a side-by-side -side anastomosis with a two-layer technique. Option, the resident and coach identify obstacles to the desired endpoint with a focus on concrete changes that can be made to improve their skills. Here, the resident, oops, excuse me. Here, the resident may have been slower than desired because of fre frequent repositioning to maintain their exposure. The coach and the resident could discuss different options for exposure to improve. And ultimately, during the wrap up, they use the time to summarize a plan to implement the change and overcome obstacles. In this situation, they decided to place stay sutures at the corners and secure those uh, with tags to a blue towel. Oops. Now, with only 30 minutes of a coaching session, the residents were able to significantly improve their technical skills. For this next study, residents who were on a two-month MIS and bariatrics rotation were randomized to the standard education and operative experience or to a, quote, comprehensive surgical coaching experience. Their task at hand was to perform a laparoscopic jejunojejunostomy. Residents in the coaching group had weekly meetings with their coach, during which time they reviewed a video and debriefed. And they used a similar framework to the GROW method we just talked about. Videos of the residents performing the lap JJ were taken at baseline and at the end of the two month period and were graded using validated scales. Here, OSAT stands for the Objective Structured Assessment of Technical Skills and BOSATS is a bariatric specific scale. You can see that both groups had improvement in their scores, but only the coaching group had significant within group improvement. On the bariatric specific scale, the coaching group scored significantly better than the control group. Additionally, residents in the coaching group significantly decreased their technical errors from baseline to post-test and add significantly fewer er errors than the control group. Surveys done by the residents demonstrated that all of them in the coaching group found that video coaching sessions were useful and that it influenced their performance in the operating room. The residents wanted to implement this in their residency program after experiencing it. The study also evaluated the ability to improve self-assessment with coaching. As I mentioned before, video coaching allows residents the opportunity to reflect on their performance before getting feedback and also provides objective evidence of strengths and weaknesses as they watch themselves operate. Self-assessment scores for residents in the coaching group were significantly correlated with expert blinded video reviewers for both the OSATs and the BOSATs scores while scores for the residents in the control arm were not correlated. Coaching increases self-awareness, a key component of continued education and growth. Coaching non-technical skills includes the domains of cognitive skills, interpersonal skills, and self-regulation. In this study, chief residents were randomly assigned to a control arm or a coaching arm. All residents performed five simulated, simulated lap coli scenarios. 
Residents in the intervention arm received 10 minutes of coaching on non-technical skills listed here in between each scenario. They purposefully limited the coaching sessions to make it realistic to what we could achieve during a full day of operating. Situational awareness includes gathering and understanding information and anticipating future state. An example of good behavior here would be pointing out the relevant anatomy in a case. Poor behavior would be waiting for a problem to arise before acting. Decision making includes considering and communicating decisions and implementing and discuss discussing those decisions. An example of good behavior here would be reaching a decision and clearly communicating it, such as, I have obtained the critical view of safety and I'm now going to apply clips. Poor behavior would be taking an inappropriate step without realizing it, such as clipping the duct before obtaining the critical view of safety. Communication and teamwork includes exchanging information for a shared understanding. A good behavior would be listening to concerns from your operating room staff, such as the anesthesiologist mentioning a change in the patient's vital signs. Poor behavior would be failing to tell the anesthesiologist if you anticipate bleeding. Leadership includes supporting others and coping well under pressure. A good behavior could be delegating tasks appropriately, such as retra retraction from your assistant. A poor behavior would be freezing under pressure. Residents in the coaching group had significantly increased their, in their scores in their, excuse me, in their non-technical skills score, while residents in the other arm had no change in their scores. Additionally, in the final lap coli scenario in which residents encountered uncontrollable bleeding, those in the coaching arm were significantly quicker to call for help than those in the control arm. While some may be skeptical about the importance of non-technical skills, Leaders like Nicholas Anton, a performance coach at Indiana University who has a background in sports psychology, firmly believes that these are not what some people would call soft skills. He says, they have a real impact on how you process information and confront difficulties. You make decisions fast and you have to live with the consequences if they don't pan out. His work is based on the idea that residents may be unaware of how external stressors affect their performance. For example, stress from training during a global pandemic, concern for a loved one who's ill, or anxiety about childcare. Residents may be struggling with time management and having difficulty focusing on the task at hand. Alternatively, they may be working next to a faculty member with whom they've had conflict in the past. At IU, in addition to their standard skills lab, Nicholas and his team have set up a mental skills curriculum, which they use to optimize how residents process what they're doing and to control fine motor skills under stressful situations. Anyone ever get a tremor when they're nervous? Some of the strategies Nicholas coaches residents on include breathing techniques to maintain calmness, what he calls psyching up to enhance focus, reframing negative thoughts so they don't distract you, and using mental imagery to anticipate potential issues. Coaching may also make us more resilient. In this study, which I'm borrowing from our internal medicine, family medicine, and pediatrics colleagues, residents were randomized to a coaching or non-coaching arm. Those in the coaching arm had an initial one-hour telephone session with a professional coach, followed by five 30-minute sessions over the subsequent four to five months. This initial meeting focused on establishing rapport between the coach and the resident, and the subsequent sessions were structured to take time to debrief, plan and set goals, discuss incorporation of new habits into their daily practice, talk about next step, and summarize a plan of action. Discussion points were completely individualized. Of note, this cost about $1,400 per resident being coached. Residents filled out baseline surveys and then repeated them at the end of the study. Residents in the coaching group reported decreased emotional exhaustion. Specifically, there was a 20% decrease in residents who reported high emotional exhaustion. There was a 17% decrease in residents who reported burnout, and their quality of life scores significantly improved. Coaching is already an integral part of residency, but there's a lot of untapped potential here. It provides a more solid framework for feedback and debriefing sessions. It acknowledges that there's more to a great operation than technical components, and it gives us techniques to help train those non-technical skills. Coaching can address mental and emotional aspects of training to improve well-being. And importantly, 
Residents in all of these studies agreed that coaching sessions were valuable and that sh they should be a part of residency. Despite its potential, there are of course some barriers to coaching. For residents, it's probably mostly about time, which is why many of the studies tried to limit sessions to 10 to 30 minutes, something that would be achievable in our daily practice. Cost also becomes an issue if professional, professional coaches are used, which is why many of the studies used, used on-site faculty as their coaches. Now, if we think about expanding coaching from just residents to faculty, we may run into some additional barriers. A qualitative study out of Canada highlights two such concerns. One surgeon said, you're expected to teach, to do research, to write grants, and that's the metric by which you're engaged. The quality of your technical skills is not a measure of which anyone gives enough weight. So it's very easy to say I'm pretty good or I'm good, my outcomes are fine, I've got bigger fish to fry. Another surgeon said that coaching has a high risk of it having negative uh, perceptions. It would be perceived as either a sign of weakness or inability or a lack of confidence because it's not the norm. On the counter argument, Dr. Atul Gawande writes that no matter how well-trained people are, few can sustain their best performance on their own. And that's where coaching comes in. So Dr. Gawande has published a great commentary on coaching in The New Yorker, um, which he entitled The Coach in the Operating Room, in which he describes his personal experience with an expert coach. He talks about how during his first several years in practice, he compared his complication rates to national averages and he watched his rates get lower and lower as he gained more experience. Then, finally, they stopped getting lower. And while they were lower than the national averages, he wasn't satisfied with his performance plateau. So he decided to hire a coach. He called in a retired surgeon he trained under and respected, and he set up a time to be observed. He, des he describes the case as going very well, and he even wondered if his coach would have anything to say when they sat down at the end. Well, as it turns out, his coach had a list full of observations. And all of them were little things. But just as they're looking for the small changes that give an elite athlete an edge in the trained podcast, it could be these little things that help an already high-performing surgeon inch closer towards perfection. So how could coaching be implemented for practicing surgeons? Well, in its current state, we spend about $2.4 billion and over 100 million hours annually towards continuing medical education in the United States. These activities often don't relate directly to individuals' practice and rarely have the capacity to change one's practice patterns. In response to these concerns, the American Board of Medical Specialties organized a group to develop a plan to redesign the continuing board certification process. And in 2019, they released their report. And I've highlighted two of their recommendations here. First, they recommend they integrate professionalism, assessment, lifelong learning and advancing practice. They further describe that the assessment should be based on both cognitive and technical skills. Rather than exam with a pass fail outcome, the goal is really to help uh, physicians strategize and continually improve their practice. Second, they recommend that they incorporate longitudinal and other innovative formative assessment strategies that support learning, identify knowledge and skills gaps. This assessment is grounded in adult learning principles, including frequent repeated interactions. Uh, in this uh, recommendation, they actually recommend annual interactions. They recommend timely feedback and analysis. They specifically recommend incorporating skills learning and assessment. And then they add that unsatisfactory performance should be met with a remediation pathway. Now, their vision sounds a lot like coaching to me. Dr. Greenberg, who's a leader in the field of surgical coaching and her team just published this article in January, delineating a plan for how surgical coaching could be the answer to the continuing board certification. They have several recommendations. First, they recommend peer-to-peer -peer coaching. This largely is a feasibility issue. Using experts or master surgeons limits the number of coaches available, and using professional coaches costs money. In their plan, surgeons would be trained to coach their colleagues. They recommend video-based coaching. This has several advantages. 
As we talked about with residents, it gives the surgeons time for self-reflection. From a practical standpoint, it eliminates traveling for in-person sessions and allows fast forwarding, rewinding, to focus on critical points of the procedure. Ideally, audiovisual recording would capture the operation as well as the team interactions in the OR so that coaches could comment on both technical and non-technical skills. Coaches would use a model such as the GROW model to develop action plans for improvement. And if possible, the surgeon and coach would be paired for several sessions to develop rapport and to follow progress over time. Lastly, they believe that the surgical societies could help facilitate coaching by identifying surgeon coach pairs or even having time set aside at annual meetings for coaching sessions. It definitely seems like a large undertaking, but Dr. Greenberg has already piloted a statewide surgical coaching program in Wisconsin. In this study, they use peer nominated surgeon coaches. The, the surgeons that are being coached um, came from a variety of practice settings, academic, private, and rural. And the pairs were able to complete between one to three coaching sessions over the one year period. They looked at how effective their relatively amateur coaches were. They looked at the perceived value of coaching and they identified several barriers. Now, this shows the flow of their study, which ultimately included eight coaches and 12 participants. And there are two things I want to highlight here. One, the coach's training requirement was only four hours. Despite a relatively short training period, participants rated the coaches as being pretty effective at the end of the study period. They gave them an average of four out of five on a Likert scale. This suggests that peers could be trained to serve as coaches relatively easily. And two, the coaching sessions were an hour long. And while the goal was to have four sessions, two or three sessions seems like a very manageable commitment spread over an entire year. The main barriers that they identified were audiovisual technology difficulties, uh, coordinating schedules between the coach and the surgeon, and time constraints, constraints due to workload. Interestingly, the main focus of the surgeon participants was non-technical skills. Their primary goals included efficiently and effectively teaching residents and medical students in the operating room and improving leadership and communication skills. Coaching for non-technical skills primarily focused on learning new procedures and improving efficiency. I'm curious if coaching on non-technical skills is perceived as less threatening and more approachable for practicing surgeons, or maybe it's just because we don't get as much non-technical skills training during residency. As with the studies among residents, the surgeons reported high value of the coaching program. One surgeon said, I truly believe that this should be the model for practice development. Normalization of the coach coachy program would be beneficial to every surgeon. In summary, performance coaching can provide a meaningful individualized approach. It is relevant to both resident training and continuing education, though we likely haven't found the perfect format just yet. And performance coaching promotes excellence in surgery by addressing both technical and non-technical skills. These are my references, which I'm happy to share in larger font size if anyone emails me. And I'd like to take this last moment to say thank you to everyone who has pushed me and pulled me and stood by my side through this journey. Uh, this first picture is me and my husband, uh, Willis, who's a pulmonary critical care fellow here. Uh, this is taken along Highway 1 at the end of our, or the end of my research years. This was a really special trip. One, I think if you haven't taken the drive down Highway 1, it's stunning. You should definitely add it to your list of things to do while in California. Um, it was kind of exciting along there because there was a motorcycle crash and I just happened to have my tourniquet and thought that I was going to get to use it because <laughs> there was a man who had an open tib fib fracture. And turns out there's really no cell phone reception along uh, that stretch of highway. Luckily, he was fine. I didn't have to use my tourniquet, but it was available. And then my mom and my sister have been um, just incredible support, um, especially since we've had our baby, Cleo, who's here now 13 months. And she is just a cyclone of energy and love and happiness. And a big smile from her and her belly laughs just melts away any negative energy I ever may feel. And then my 
co-residents, both my initial class, sorry, Carl, you're not pictured in the girls only picture, <laughs> and our uh, newfound reshuffled class has, um, they've just all been great, a great group of people to talk to, and I'm really hoping that now that COVID restrictions are loosening up, that we can spend some more time before everyone goes off in their various directions. And then I had two main mentors. The first here, Dr. Jerkovic, who served both as a, a wonderful mentor and sponsor, um, is always available to me and particularly helpful with the, the 20,000 20, foot view. Um, my other mentor who, despite him being at every presentation I, I gave, don't have a picture with Dr. Utter, um, but he was, he spent countless hours with me as I was just trying to figure out anything about research from learning how to write an IRB to getting my first paper published. And um, I really was always impressed by his thoughtfulness and his thoroughness with which he approached every single study I brought to him. So thank you again to everybody. Looking forward to the future steps and I will gladly take any questions or comments. talk and we were all sort of thinking how we can help uh, encourage you during your next phase of your career here as a fellow to sort of integrate some of these things in what we're doing. I will have to say that I would say about at least 50% of my division chiefs now all have coaches, many of the other faculty. Um, the, and we've thought about expanding that more into how to use it. You're right, the transition from having coaching being seen as a negative mm -hmm. to something positive is really, uh, really key for all of this. And if you think of all the money we spend on the after the fact issue, you know, fixing what we think is physician's behavior and surgeon's behavior, uh, if we invest a little more upfront, I think it would be useful. I also think People forget that surgery is a craft. Mm -hmm. It requires constant attention. I remember telling all of you when you applied, the privilege of having a skills in your hands that to impact people's lives in the most profound way. It never changes. And when I think of the master surgeons I know, they've spent their life tying knots while they're watching TV mm -hmm. and making sure that their craft is part of uh, their <coughs> continuous development and self-assessment. You know, when, when am I not as good at my craft and how do I change that? And so keeping that at the forefront of your lifelong learning that you described it is really critical. If you sort of stop, then you really, you know, aren't true to that tradition that you um, committed to when you started. So. Uh, really fabulous uh, presentation and looking forward to all the extra work we're going to make you do. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> looking forward to it. <laughs> as, we, as we think about how to incorporate this. You know, we've had lots of fun. The, the faculty have put a lot of effort into thinking about how to entice medical students into becoming surgeons and how to influence them sooner. I know some of your colleagues have been involved in those conversations and it's it's a continuum. Mm -hmm. how, to, how to stay involved in this. So, Really fantastic. Dr. Ali. Where to begin on such a wonderful talk? Um, con congratulations on your upcoming graduation. Um, you know, minimally invasive surgeons really got into using video a long time ago just because it was kind of there. Yep. Um, and our fellows actually record most of their cases and say they find tremendous value in relating that evening what they were hearing as different things were happening so i think that's a, a a great thing i do believe that surgery is a game that's won or lost in the trenches among the details and not the large bullet points of steps of procedure so i i totally agree with that um a couple things i'd like you to comment on the first of which is that you know it's hard to it, it's it's tougher to for someone to be engaged in something that they're not totally interested in and so as you go through general surgery residency there you might face things that you're more interested in than others so it begs the question in my mind that's what i'd like you to comment on is would would you are there things that are more appropriate for different stages of their of the career so could coaching on talking to patient families be part of general surgery 
early training and then later on people differentiate into the things they're more interested in where they're more receptive to getting those details. So that's question number one. And question number two is a lot of times intervention by the coach is seen as a, a transgression to the autonomy of the trainee. And, and this is specific in residency training and specific in surgery. But it's not that way for Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps, when the coach says, do this, right? Because, because there's this idea of the surgical paradigm is, you need to allow me to struggle so I can figure it out. That goes totally against anything that coaches do. And actually, I, t I talk to the fellows, my fellows, about this all the time. I'm like, letting you struggle allows you to build bad habits. Building bad habits, building technical inadequacies then requires unlearning and relearning. But, but that relationship has to exist, not for that to be seen as critical, and has to be accepted by the learner for what it is, rather than a transgression on their autonomy. So point, so question one is focus through the years, and question <laughs> two is how do we reconcile that perceived transgression on autonomy? Thank you for your comments and questions. Um, for the first part, <clears throat> yes, I definitely think that coaching could be used um, in different um, settings as residents progress from intern year through their chief year. Um, one of the ways that I think we could easily do it for interns or second levels is to use it for the procedures, like the arterial lines, the central lines. Um, we have to be there to sort of proctor them. And so to having a kind of standard debriefing session afterwards where we review the steps and even if they did really well to point out slight ways that they could do something more efficiently, like, oh, I, ha I hold my wire like this versus like this, or I try to drape with the ultrasound probe like this while you did this. Um, just identifying those little things. I think it takes um, close attention to detail from the coach. So you have to have a willing coach as well as someone, as you mentioned for the second question, someone who's willing to take that feedback. Um, and then, you know, there's a variety of settings you talked about. Um, you could have coaching for um, clinic visits. You could have coaching for the trauma activations, which are already recorded. And then I think ultimately coaching in the OR. Um, the other place where I think coaching naturally falls is with these studies is really in the sim lab. So coaching for our FES and FLS, and then like Dr. Raskin is organizing the robotics coaching. So those are just natural ways that we can incorporate it into our program, already kind of set up to do a lot of that. Um, as far as the transgression for coaching. So I think a little bit of it is, of course, a mindset, as you brought up. Um, I think that there's a difference between letting residents struggle through a technique and letting residents kind of find their way through a more difficult procedure. So well, we may be able to do, say, a straightforward gallbladder. If there is a person that comes in with, you know, all the terrible gallbladders we see here where there's not necessarily one trick they need to do, but some part of surgery is just keep going. Don't give up, keep doing the safe thing, keep looking for the anatomy, keep reorienting yourself and taking those small steps, keep making progress. So I think there's a fine line of you know when to intervene. Then of course, I think how people intervene. So um, you know if you have someone who is a good coach and who is able to say, hey, try turning your wrist this way so you can get a better bite versus hey, I'm going to take the instrument now and show you how I like to do it, and now you watch me for the rest of the case. <laughs> so I think that's one of the advantages, too, to doing the feedback and debriefing and coaching sessions after the fact, because you lose some of that um, possible tension between the coach and uh, resident. Hi, I just, um, first, as expected, excellent talk. I really Thanks. enjoyed it. I really enjoyed your relation to sports. I think as a prior athlete, I really reflected on my lifetime of just being kind of critiqued in a positive way to get better. And then I think as a resident, having somebody say, no, do it this way, you know, do it that way. And I think probably most of us graduating feel a little bit uneasy about no longer having that in the operating room and worrying that how do I continue to get better? Um, am I only going to learn from my mistakes if I'm alone in there? Um, so what are your thoughts about becoming a fellow or young faculty and how to continue to get that feedback and continue to get coached and get better um, when we're no longer residents? Yeah, 
Thank you. I think that's definitely something that uh, drove me to investigate this a little bit. I think that for most junior faculty, luckily, um, they have senior faculty that are more than willing to come and watch them operate, especially if you think you're going to have a more challenging case. Um, and I imagine that if you ask them to watch you perform some technical portion of the procedure that they would be more than willing to offer their piece of advice on that. Um, I do think that you know implementing a, a peer coaching program could be useful too. I think some of the most gifted surgeons I see are the ones that just walk into another surgeon's operating room and observe and say, oh, how do you do that? Why don't I do it that way? What are the differences? And they're just always curious about the different steps that they could be taking. Let me assure all of you, and I think not, people don't realize this, but when you go to a new hospital, almost every hospital in the country, you have a proctoring period. Sometimes the proctoring period is quite long Many places, Kaiser, for example, it's three years before a sort of you become a partner decision is made. And that has a lot to do not only with your technical skill, but your interaction skills, uh, all of that. Um, in the academic environment, it's really your division chief and your partners that are part of uh, working together. But it is, so don't be surprised when you encounter proctoring and some oversight, it's not a um, punitive thing. It's, and to, to use that as a coaching opportunity is really great, and to turn that, those people into partners is, is the goal. Dr. Jerkovich. I don't have a question for you, Jess. I want to just congratulate you on a terrific uh, uh, talk that um, represents a summary of your thinking about a residency program that had such an important component of your life. And so you clearly spent some time at the end thinking about you know, the whole uh, process of becoming a surgeon and how to incorporate that into a lifelong career. Um, it's the beginning of, uh, of a terrific investment of time and energy and thought process into training future surgeons. And I hope we can entice you to take advantage of this background in the next year when you're here and help us with some of these topics. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. That was a wonderful talk. Um, you know, just one thing that I was reflecting on as you were talking about this uh, Atul Gawande and him continuing to learn was where that balance is in the attendings continuing to learn and the residents need uh, to also learn by doing mm -hmm. sort of in that situation. Just hoping you could comment on that. Are, are you getting into the residents sort of struggling? Or I'm, no, I guess I'm not more totally that sure. um, often as senior residents work with junior faculty, the junior faculty are still learning sort of their style and their need to do the operation. Um, and then the senior residents need to also do the operation to sort of learn, yeah. having observed, you know, throughout a good portion of our residency. Yes. Um, just uh, and, and finding difficulty in that balance myself as, you know, wanting to do the operation, but then not having that that chance to do it because of the, the attendings need to continue learning. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, first, I think there's something that always something that we can take away from being in the operating room and that what you take away from a case may vary depending on what the case is and who's doing the case and what level that person doing the case is. Um, and so even, I guess, if you're not able to participate as much in the actual operative portion, I think you can probably take a look at how this junior faculty member is approaching a case, how they're, um, one of the things I've started paying a lot more attention to in my chief years, of course, is exposure. It's really easy to do the operation when someone sets it up nicely for you. And all of a sudden, when your attending doesn't scrub in and you're trying to get down to the pubic tubercle to put your mes mesh uh, suture in, it's a, a lot more challenging. And so just being aware of those little steps that they take to set things up, um, where they place you know, the retractor on the bed, how they put their ports in, things like that, um, and seeing how that either helps them or hurts them, I think can uh, be really helpful. We try to be mindful of how we set up the rotations to match where are there senior people, where are there junior people, when I think about how we hire faculty, thinking about you know, making the right balance of people to help the education process, but it's, it's a big uh, maze, but those are important comments, mm -hmm. and you're 100% correct, you can learn both from excellence and, and 
uh, improving style in the operating room that you can take things away. We'll let Dr. Raskin have the final question and comment. So Jesse, just a really insightful um, talk this morning. And I can relate to a lot of that because as a child and as a teenager, all the way into medical school, really, I had a coach, a sports coach, um, always, soccer, volleyball, rugby, what have you. And when I was a resident, it was the first time I felt like, where's that coach? Because I had a lot of mentors or people teaching me, but I didn't have a coach. And so as I got more into long distance running as a resident, just like you were saying, finding that passion, um, I had a running coach that I hired um, who served kind of as a surgical coach for mm -hmm. me because there's so many parallels between yep. you know, trying to do better. In my case, I was trying to run ultra marathons as a resident and I didn't know how I was gonna do that. Yeah. And, um, and that person gave me insight into my own career and what I was doing for work. And so what I really wanted to point out is when you graduate at a residency, suddenly all of that is gone. You don't have the, uh, the, the coaches that were kind of natural in the environment. And I would encourage everyone to look for jobs as your first job out in a location where those coaches kind of naturally exist. I've oftentimes said to residents, your first job, you should find mentorship and that should be the number one thing you look for. Your, your second job, if you have a second job, sh you should look for partnership because you're, you're young and you, you don't know what you don't know and so I was lucky where I stayed at University of Minnesota. I had coaches all around me and I, I stayed there on purpose. Um, didn't get paid much money, but I got paid back in, in, in huge dividends from the coaching and the support that was there. So just something to keep in mind as we look for your first jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for those comments. Thank you again, spectacular presentation. Thank you.